An important topic in complex analysis is that of conformal mappings. And these mappings have several applications in science and engineering, for example, brain image mapping in medical physics and even solving nonlinear partial differential equations in specific geometries. And the reason they're so useful is because conformal mappings are mappings that have this angle preserving property. So conformal mappings basically just preserve angles between curves mapped from one set to another. Now, what exactly makes a function a conformal mapping? For that analysis, we're going to be considering w equal to f of z being an analytic function, and we're going to take the function to have a non-vanishing derivative. So I've brought back our friends the z-plane and w-plane. So here's the z-plane, and here's the w-plane. And I want to consider two curves, c1 and c2, in the z-plane that intersect at some complex number z naught. Now these curves transform under w equal to f of z into two new curves. Let's call them c1 prime and c2 prime. And these two intersect at the complex number w naught equal to f of z naught. So to analyze the angles between the curves, I'm going to need tangent vectors. So for the curve C1, let this be the tangent vector at Z naught, that is DZ1. And for the curve C2, similarly, I have DZ2. Now let me write them using the polar form. So DZ1 equals absolute value DZ1 times e to the i phi 1. And DZ2 equals the absolute value of DZ2 times e to the phi 2, where phi1 and phi2 are the arguments of dz1 and dz2, respectively. So to get the angle between the curves, I need the angle between the tangent vectors. So I just take them to the origin and connect their starting points, and I measure the angle between them. So obviously, the angle between them is going to be phi1 minus phi2, or we can say that this is the absolute value of phi 1 minus phi 2, so that we get a positive value. Okay, now what about the angles between the transformed curve? Again, we need tangent vectors. So for the curve C1 prime, let me write this as dw1, and the tangent vector for C2 prime would be dw2. Now these differential elements in the w plane are related to those in the z plane, because of the transformation w equal to f of z. So we can write dw1 equals df by dz evaluated at z naught times dz1. And dw2 equals df by dz evaluated at z naught times dz2. Now the function f is holomorphic which means it doesn't matter along what direction the derivative is evaluated. It always results in the same complex number for z naught. So that means we can write it in the polar form as df by dz absolute value times e to the i alpha, where alpha is the argument, and this implies that dw1 equals absolute value df by dz times e to the i alpha, and expanding dz1 in this form as well gives me absolute value dz1, times e to the i phi 1. So this implies that dw1 equals the modulus of df by dz, times dz1, times e to the i alpha, times e to the i phi 1. And of course, this means that we have an argument of alpha plus phi 1. By the same token, we have dw2 equal to the modulus of df by dz times dz2 times e to the i alpha plus phi2. So we've increased both the arguments phi1 and phi2 by the same number alpha, which implies that the angle between the transformed curves c1 prime and c2 prime is still going to be phi 1 minus phi 2. So we see that the angles here were preserved. So for a function to be a conformal mapping, we need it to be holomorphic. 
But that's not the only assumption I started out this analysis with. I also said that the derivative of the function is non-zero. Why is that important? Let me give you an example of how a vanishing derivative means that angles will not be preserved. This time for the z-plane, I'm considering two straight lines, c1 and c2, that intersect at the origin. Now, the argument of any complex number on c1 is phi1 and for c2, let's call it phi2. If I subject these curves to a transformation, w equal to z squared, then what happens is that the argument of each complex number is doubled. So for the curve c1 prime, it's 2 phi1, and for the curve uh, c2 prime, it's 2 phi2. So initially, the angle between the curves at their point of intersection was phi1 minus phi2, whereas now it's 2 times phi1 minus phi2. So we see that the angle between the curves is not preserved where the derivative of the function, that is z squared, is zero, as in at the origin. And this makes perfect sense if we recall our knowledge on holomorphic inverse functions. If angles are preserved in moving from the z-plane to the w-plane, they should be preserved if we move in the opposite sense. And if the derivative of the function is zero, then that means the derivative of the inverse mapping is not defined there. And we can't do that tangent vector analysis that we did before. Of course, there's a way to work around this if I pick sets where the function is holomorphic and has a non-zero derivative. For example, let's consider once again f of z equal to z squared. Then this function maps conformally the half plane REZ being positive to the slit plane C excluding negative infinity to zero. We see that on this set, the derivative of f of z is non-zero. And the inverse mapping f of z equal to the square root of z does the perfect job of conformally mapping the slit plane onto this half plane. And we can do this for other functions too. For example, the exponential function f of z equal to e to the z. This function is a conformal mapping that takes the strip i and z less than pi and greater than negative pi to the slit plane c excluding negative infinity to zero. And of course, its, uh, its inverse function maps the slit plane onto the strip conformally as well. So that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.